former U.S. Secretary of Defense Robert Gates joins us now. His book, Exercise of Power, American Failure, Successes, and a New Path Forward in the Post-Cold War World, is out now in paperback. It's great to have you, sir. Secretary Gates, always an honor to to have you with us. Um, let, let's talk about, uh, in, in the book, uh, America's uh, retreat from the world and uh, its, its, its changing worldview of going from a country that was the indispensable power to a disorganized uh, country uh, with a jumbled foreign policy. Well, first of all, it's a pleasure to be with you all again, uh, Mika and Joe. I, I would say that uh, our withdrawal, if you will, is is based on a couple of things. The, the first is uh, 20 years of war. Uh, after initial military successes uh, in both Iraq and Afghanistan, the American military was given a mission of nation building, in effect, and a mission for which they were neither equipped nor trained, and uh, and we've had a long slog. Uh, we tried to impose democracy at the point of a gun in places as diverse as Somalia and Haiti uh, in the early 90s to Iraq and Afghanistan in the early 2000s. Uh, so I think there's a frustration and an exhaustion on the part of the American people <clears throat> with these with these uh, wars that has contributed to an impatience with uh, trying to continue to exercise uh, American leadership. I think the other aspect of it is we've, <clears throat> we've also dismantled all those instruments of power that we're, were so vital in the Cold War for strategic communications and uh, diplomacy and development and, and so on and really haven't found anything to replace them here. A few years ago, Hu Jintao, uh, China's leader, invested $7 billion in creating a strategic communications capability for China, and we don't have anything comparable. Uh, and, and I think that the domestic paralysis, uh, uh, polarization here at home uh, has contributed to, uh, to a, a sense of pulling back and, and to a loss of American leadership. We, we no longer are seen as the model uh, by much of the world as, as we find it impossible to do big things uh, domestically. I, and and your, your argument uh, has been that the United States should have left uh, Afghanistan not in 2009 or 10 or 11, but as early as 2002? Yes, um, as as I point out in the book, uh, you know, we had accomplished our mission. It was an extraordinary military achievement uh, at very low cost and and uh, very few casualties. And by 2002, by January 2002, uh, you had an Afghan government that was recognized internationally. Yeah, all the different parties in Afghanistan were participating, except the Taliban, who were hiding in uh, in Pakistan. Uh, you had uh, international agreements to provide economic and military assistance, uh, and and the Taliban wouldn't, as we see now, wouldn't return at all for at least three or four years. So there was a window there. <laughs> And that would have been the moment for the United States to basically declare victory, declare success, uh, and turn the problem over to the international community and to the Afghans themselves. Secretary Gates, it's Willie Geis. Good to have you on with us this morning. Uh, people like General Petraeus, others have said we should keep a small force in Afghanistan because, of course, the Taliban will come back, will pop its head up again, and will be forced to go back and, and deal with it. Um, do you believe that is the right way to go? or? What happens if we pull out, if we go through with a complete withdrawal before the 20th anniversary of 9-11, as the Biden administration has announced, no American troops on the ground, and there is some kind of attack launched from Afghani soil? I'm, I'm sure that uh, I would have uh, agreed with Secretary Austin and the Joint Chiefs in terms of urging a uh, that we keep a, a modest military presence there, both for morale purposes and, frankly, to uh, provide the on-site training and, and equipping of the, of the Afghans. Uh, but it's a very tough choice. The president really is presented with only bad options here because the fact is, even with 2,500 or 3,500 American troops in Afghanistan, the Taliban are gaining ground every single day. 
uh, they are increasing their control over the countryside uh, and and uh, there's no reason to believe there's anything in the cards that uh, is going to lead to a reversal of that so of the p many potential uh, outcomes in in Afghanistan a happy ending in my view is is one of the least likely which makes it all the more critical that we continue our economic and military assistance once our troops are out you know when the Soviet troops fully withdrew in 1988 uh, the Najibula government that had been installed by the Soviets actually lasted for three years, as long as the Soviet flow of military and economic assistance continued. And when the Soviet Union collapsed and that assistance ended, the Najibula government uh, collapsed. So uh, if there's one ray of hope here uh, for the survival of the Afghan government and for the freedoms that Afghan women in particular have enjoyed uh, over the last number of years. It is the continuing flow of economic and military assistance from the United States and our allies that helps the uh, Afghans, uh, uh, Afghan government uh, keep the Taliban at bay. But it's, it's, uh, it's a pretty grim situation, frankly. Mr. Secretary, I'd like to uh, turn our questioning to Russia. We've been following the situation with opposition leader Alexei Navalny and also following the president uh, gently mentioning that Vladimir Putin is a killer uh, and saying to him that he doesn't think he has much of a soul. Uh, what should the administration's posture be toward Russia right now? And how do you think President Biden is managing his relationship with Vladimir Putin? I think that uh, actually there's a in in most respects there's pretty much a great deal of continuity between the Trump administration and the Biden administration when it comes to Russia. Russia under Putin is a great disruptor. Uh, one of his sole uh, objectives is to create as much trouble for the United States and for the Western democracies as he possibly can, whether it's along the borders with Eastern Europe or in Ukraine or the Black Sea or a host of other places or the interference in our own domestic affairs. So I think the tough line that has been taken is, uh, is exactly the right one. Uh, I think we have to reconcile ourselves <coughs> to the fact that uh, Vladimir Putin is going to leave office feet first, one way or the other. Uh, he's never going to be able to give up power or want to. Uh, and so this is a challenge that we're, we're going to have to face uh, uh, going forward. And I think, frankly, the administration's approach is uh, a tough approach is the right one. Mr. Secretary, a man uh, that, uh, of course, Mika loved and had uh, a great deal of respect for you, Dr. Brzezinski, wrote a book called Strategic Vision, and uh, we heard him uh, on this show, but also privately complain about America's lack of strategic vision uh, throughout the 21st century. Uh, you talk about our lack of, uh, of a strategic vision uh, facing China. Why has it been so difficult for the past two or three presidents to have the sort of global, holistic uh, a worldview and strategic vision that we had at least during the Cold War. You know, I think I think Joe. One of the uh, reasons that it's been difficult is that uh, you know we we proceeded for a good part of the last forty years on the mistaken assumption that a richer China would be a freer China. And I think that's only been with the advent of uh, President Xi Jinping in 2013 that we've seen a much more, that a, that a richer China will become a much more assertive and aggressive China. And, and so my concern really is that since that time, since it's become so clear that this is going to be a competitive relationship going forward. And unlike the Cold War, one that is, that is going to be waged, a rivalry that will be waged in many dimensions. It won't just be a military standoff. It will be economic. It will be strategic communications, uh, development, diplomacy, Belt and Road. All those things are part of a very much more complicated relationship than uh, than existed before and certainly existed uh, between the United States and the Soviet Union. And, and we have not been able to come up with a cohesive strategy since 2013 on how to deal with this challenge uh, that combines all the different elements of American national power, very much as the Chinese have been able to do in pursuing their objectives. And until we can get an integrated strategy that brings all these elements of 
of power based on strong military capabilities, uh, I think we'll I think we will be pay, playing catch up ball. Hey, thanks so much for watching our YouTube channel. You can follow up on today's top stories and breaking news or catch up on your favorite MSNBC shows all in one place. Download the NBC News app today.